views and opinions expressed may not reflect those of the Allen County Public Library, Access Fort Wayne, and or any other supporting groups. If you are interested in producing your own programs for Access Fort Wayne, you can contact us at 260-421-1250. Welcome to County Line. Hi everyone, I'm Mike Green, Public Information Officer in the Allen County Commissioner's Office, and welcome to County Line, the program that features news and information about and from your Allen County government. Well, back in the 80s and 90s, probably one of the most, if not the most, prevalent health issues was HIV and AIDS, not just in this nation alone, but on a worldwide basis. And it's taken a lot of work on a global effort to try and stem the tide of number of cases and the way we go about treating uh, people who have contracted the HIV virus. That has been kept under the radar a little bit here in recent years. We're not hearing quite as much about HIV and AIDS, but recently here in Indiana we've had a situation uh, where an outbreak has occurred in Scott County, which is uh, toward southern Indiana. Uh, almost 150 cases and counting uh, as of this taping. Uh, we wanted to find out what we have here in Fort Wayne and Allen County that can be of service to folks who may be concerned about whether they or a loved one uh, have HIV. And so we've come to the uh, clinic uh, for Fort Wayne and Allen County Health Department near New Haven to talk with Kathy Thornson, who is the director of HIV STD prevention for the health department, along with uh, Susie Sisney, who is the Director of Clinical Services. And ladies, first of all, we appreciate you taking time to join us and talk a little bit about this subject. It's nice to be here, Mike. Thanks. Well, Kathy, um, let's start with you and kind of give us an idea of where we stand here in Allen County in terms of HIV cases uh, compared to, say, back in the 80s and 90s, decades ago, when it really was uh, a huge concern. Okay, well... Nationally, we see, you know, still thousands of cases each year, but as far as locally, we did a real push in testing early on in the 80s, and tons of testing was done. We saw probably twice as many positives as we do now. It's been a message I think the community took to heart. However, I do think you're right on the button when you talk about the ebb and flow of you know the awareness that people have so currently we we do feel it is an important message particularly young people need to step forward and realize that there is risk with hiv and be able to assess how much risk they take we definitely encourage testing um, also we've seen in our area the the men having sex with men population is definitely our highest percentage of positives we are glad to finally see a lot more of the African-American community to step forward and starting to test as well. But that kind of has been a, a trending that we've seen over the, you know, those period of years. Uh, the Scott County uh, incidents of HIV cases are primarily uh, due to the sharing of uh, needles, as I understand it, uh, from drug usage. Uh, is it still kind of a, a task on the part of folks like you to get the word out that, that this really is a behavioral, for lack of a better term, behavioral type of uh, way of transmitting the virus. Yes, we definitely want people to be aware of the risks that increase the likelihood of becoming infected with HIV. Um, definitely through the transmission of blood, it is the most effective transmission. And that blood, obviously, with the needle issue for the southern Indiana situation is, is of concern. 
Um, we do a lot of data collecting being a health department and in the population that we see doing HIV testing now with us, we test here in the clinic, which Susie may talk uh, more about, but we also do some satellite testing out in the community. Um, the Positive Resource Center also off offers testing in the community. and. In the testing that we currently are doing, we're seeing that 6% of all the tests that we're doing are people that do acknowledge they are using needles, sharing needles. Um, and that's an increase for us, just a little blip on the radar. But, um, you know, I think that's, we keep our eye on it. We want to be really tuned into what's going on. We don't want to have some big issue up in this area. So public health wise, we try and keep our pulse on what's going on and try and do prevention and awareness as much as possible. What are the messages that you're trying to get out into the community and the information you're trying to share today as say compared to previous years or is it pretty much the same type of message? You know, it's not so much that the message has changed so much. Um, it's just important, though, that the younger population, I think, realize that um, since they have grown up in a time period of only knowing a world with HIV, they need to realize that it's not something that you just take in stride. Um, it is a preventable infection. There are medications that have grown leaps and bounds over the years with the infection. But that, too, needs to be remembered that those medications, they are like big drugs. They're... they're you know, like chemotherapy, they have side effects and prevention, knowing the ways the transmission of HIV, you know, it's certain body fluids, those are the transmission modes. So if you can know something as simple as that and keep your body fluids with yourself and keep the partner's body fluids with them, you know, that's the ticket to not pass infection. Well, Susie, let's bring you in and talk a little bit now about uh, the clinical services that are available, not only for folks who may be concerned about uh, whether they have HIV, but, but other sexually transmitted diseases. Allen County Health Department's one of the few counties, um, county health departments in Indiana that does run an STD HIV clinic. Our services are provided to anybody in the community and those outside of this county. Um, we will um, always see clients, even the young people of their own consent are, are able to come to the clinic. So we really encourage the young people, like Kathy said, to become more aware that this transmission is a possibility uh, based on risks that they might be encountering. Uh, our nurses here in the clinic will test for any communicable sexually transmitted illness. Although we do test for HIV, the county here does not treat for HIV. Well, what would be the the normal procedure i guess for someone who is who is concerned and comes to the clinic uh, wanting a to be tested we do a complete um examination and testing based on any kind of symptomology that the patients might have um, we do uh, quick testing for hiv which is an aura quick oral swab testing and that takes about a 20 minute turnaround time for results that can be done right here in the clinic if any kind of blood testing is required, then that blood testing also is taken here at the clinic and sent to outside laboratory for confirmatory information. We also test for other STIs um, through urine testing. The nurses will do a full exam under the direction of Dr. Deborah McMahon. And these are um, confidential? Everything here is confidential that we do. Um, Patients are advised of their rights when they come in. They sign for consent and treatment, and then all test results are provided to the patient on a confidential basis. If a test comes back positive, what do your folks do next? It depends on what we exactly find. In the case of HIV, there, that is um, Kathy's team. Then that follows up and does surveillance on that test. All testing that we do here for any communicable disease is passed on to the state health department and in turn is passed on to CDC. Kathy, talk to us a little bit about, and, and Susie was mentioning uh, the fact that uh, you will do testing and offer counseling to young people even though perhaps parental consent has not been given or, or has not been sought. That's kind of a touchy issue, I can understand. Sure, I'm a parent, I get it. Um, the whole topic is touchy, and the, the minor consent law, it is a law in the books, and, and it's, it's across the nation, and for good reason, because you just don't 
really want to have any roadblocks that would stop someone from trying to get medical care on an issue that can sometimes have a lot of stigma with it or there's just the idea especially in a young adolescent's mind of being judged or you know just not knowing what the consequences are so we try and take roadblocks out um our nurses are excellent here though i mean they're always strongly encouraging you know like that adult relationship trying to reach out to a parent or a teacher or you know, someone from your church, you know, to have that type of relationship, someone to talk to, is so essential in any, you know, adolescent development. And so, you know, yes, they can come on their own consent, but we also encourage them to try and help keep them growing in a healthy manner there emotionally as well. You do have counseling services as well, correct? Yes, we do um, counseling service specific to HIV, but we also have outside community collaborators that come in for mental health counseling. Um, we do smoke cessation. I mean, there's a number of people that come in and collaborate within the clinic trying to reach the specific needs of our clients, making it easy for them to access. How important is the reduction of, of the stigma that can be attached to HIV or any sexually transmitted disease for that matter? as far as getting a, a person to come in and, and find out more? It's, it's huge because, as we know, so many of the sexually transmitted infections do not come with symptoms. And so people really need to just have that open, honest conversation with themselves, you know, if it's, you know, something of such a personal nature. But they need to take that assessment of, have I placed myself at risk? Is there the possibility I could have been exposed? And then get to that mature enough decision of, you know what, I just need to make an appointment, get myself checked, and it's that simple. Susie, from a clinical services standpoint, what, what kind of hours uh, do you operate? Would someone have to have an appointment to come in, or, or can they just walk in? The clinic's open Monday through Friday. Our hours are 8 to 4.30. Um, we do take appointments if that works best for a client, but we also have walk-in available each day. And it's here at the clinic on New Haven Avenue? It is. It is held here at the Medical Annex, 4813 New Haven Avenue. Okay. Um, and, Kathy, uh, where are you taking your message these days? Uh, is it schools, workplaces, general community? How are you getting the word out about uh, the fact that HIV is obviously still here? and uh, still needs to be taken seriously. Well, we definitely look at our data. I mean, we are public health, and so that drives our, our direction, obviously, quite easily. Um, definitely the young population. Most STDs occur within the population under age 25. So we do focus with the schools, with trying to reach different groups. We have... Um, different health venues, like the AIDS walk is coming up, where, you know, just trying to get your message out in any one of those venues that, that seems to be able to reach. Um, besides that bigger population work with the awareness within the community, the counselors here um, on, on my team, they, they do that next step, that public health piece of what about the partners. So if somebody is diagnosed with, you know, whether it's HIV or gonorrhea or chlamydia, syphilis, they have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. They kind of bring up their knowledge on their specific infection. They let them have some understanding that, you know, could happen to anyone. Let's try and figure out a plan so it doesn't happen to you again. So we want some reduction in risk going on. Understand the meds that they're having and then talk about the partners. I mean, whether it's a sexual partner or a needle sharing partner, you know, that's based on the risk of the individual. But we actually go through that process. It's extremely confidential. But the individual has the choice if they want to notify a partner or if they understand the importance of it, but they themselves just can't figure out how they're going to have that conversation, then they'll tell one of my investigators enough information so that my investigator can discreetly get a hold of that contact to let them know they've possibly been aware, you know, make them aware that they've possibly been exposed to something and let them know how they can get themselves tested and move down the chain for what they need. So the idea is to do it all quickly so we don't end up with a lot of people infected. <laughs> and the collaboration with outside groups and organizations has got to be vital for you folks. I think that's part of public health. We have a tremendous community. I mean, it's constant networking. And public health is not just 
you know, the Fort Wayne Allen County Health Department, public health is really, it's all of our collaborators in the community, it's the hospitals, I mean, it's private citizens do so many things on engaging with collaborations with us, it's phenomenal. I mean, we have a fabulous community, I think, for working with. Kathy Thornton and Susie Sisney, thanks so much for joining us, taking some time to discuss the, the subject with uh, our viewers. And hopefully now you've got a better understanding, if you didn't before, about what is available here at the Fort Wayne Allen County Department of Health. If you have concerns about HIV or any other sexually transmitted disease, you can come to the clinic here in New Haven Avenue and you can find out more about the services they have to offer, the testing that's available to you. Well, the concept of regional cooperation in Northeast Indiana isn't something particularly new. I mean, we all know about the Northeast Indiana Regional Partnership. We know about the Northeast Indiana Regional Chamber of Commerce that we have, both involved with uh, growing economic development in our area of the state. But a new initiative has been proposed and is being worked on at this time. It's called the Regional Cities Initiative in Indiana. So what does a regional cities initiative have to do with Allen County and why is Allen County interested in this? Well, Commissioner Nelson Peters is with us to talk a little more about that and also to explain about the regional cities initiative. And first of all, Commissioner Peters, we appreciate you joining us as Thank always. Thank you. Glad to be here. So let, let's talk about first uh, as to how the regional cities initiative came about and exactly what it is for folks who may not be that familiar with it. Regional Cities Initiative was conceived through the Indiana Economic Development Corporation, uh, referred to as the IEDC. That's the governor's arm for economic development related issues throughout the state of Indiana. And I think they've grown to know what we've known in northeastern Indiana all along, and that is that it's going to take strong regions to compete in the global economy. Uh, we can't do it any longer, Fort Wayne or Fort Wayne and Allen County versus the world. So we've got to rely on nine county partners, as it is right now, to help us fight that battle and bring jobs to, to northeastern Indiana. And so what the state did in their recognition of that very issue was they initially conceived the idea that if they put $80 million aside and then awarded it to two or three regions throughout the state of Indiana uh, for as much quality of life, quality of place purposes as anything, uh, then they would get regions to coalesce around the idea of improving the quality of life and so forth in their communities. Now, that, uh, that sum has since been dropped to $10 million, and as you tape this show today, the General Assembly is still deliberating the issue. So it appears that the offering to local regions will be anywhere between 10 and $80 million. Okay. So this money is kind of being used as a, a carrot at the end of the stick of sorts to, to get different areas in the state to work together in a, in a regional capacity? It's actually a carrot in a number of respects. It's a carrot to get the uh, regions uh, to work uh, amongst themselves, but it's also a carrot to leverage private and uh, local government dollars uh, to, to supplement that which the state is providing uh, local regions. And through that, uh, there is a requirement, from what I understand, that a regional development authority, which is referred to as an RDA, uh, be established. Now, the regional development authority is, is a vehicle that allows uh, a state, I'm sorry, uh, a county and an adjoining county, uh, a city and an adjoining uh, county, to increase the community economic development income tax, commonly referred to as CEDIT, for purposes of matching the dollars that will be coming from the state of Indiana. So the leverage is twofold, to get local communities to work together uh, for quality of life, quality of place projects, and to get them to work together in raising funds. We mentioned at the outset uh, such things as the, the Northeast Indiana Regional Partnership right. and the Regional Chamber of Commerce. We already have those in place and they're working in an economic development standpoint. What is it about the Regional Cities Initiative that is different or unique from the work that 
those two entities and others like them are doing right now? A lot of what those entities are doing are uh, things that are focused specifically on job creation. Uh, as I've mentioned a couple of times at the outset, this initiative is really designed to look at quality of place, quality of life type initiatives. Um, some of the projects that are currently on the table from a regional perspective are in fact the riverfront development that you hear about so much of in Fort Wayne. Um, trails seems to be a big thing that the region is talking about in terms of connectivity from LaGrange County to Allen County. Broadband is another thing that people are saying will help the quality of life within this particular region. So while the other initiatives you talked about through the regional partnership focus on really the, the nuts and bolts of the economy and job creation, these, these focus on the, the, the fun quality of life type things. Well, it's one thing to create jobs, but if you don't have the people who are here to fill those jobs, uh, that doesn't do you a lot of good. And, and, exactly and, right. and vice versa, you get the people in here, but you don't have the jobs yeah. to take place. And, and the population in Indiana has stagnated somewhat from my, what I understand over the last 10 years or so. It has. We're growing at a rate of about 2% uh, in the region. And we want to get to uh, we want to get to a million people by by the year 2030 because we believe that's the critical mass that will allow for additional job creation. Uh, it will allow for the critical mass uh, of the of the youth population to fill some of the jobs that the baby boomers will be leaving. And so, how do you get there? You create the types of things that the millennials and some of the other folks uh, like in a community, like trails, like mm -hmm. things on the riverfront. So the Regional Cities Initiative isn't duplicating the work of these other entities that are not at all. in place and really not working ahead of them. They're, they're working side by side with one another in essence. Yeah, they really are. They are uh, meant to be uh, compatible. Uh, but not duplicative. Okay. Now, uh, I understand that we've already had some meetings that have taken place uh, among uh, county officials such as yourself, mm -hmm. along with some of the cities here in Northeast Indiana. Tell us a little bit about what has taken place as far as uh, beginning uh, the initiative here in our area? What the state of Indiana and the um, IEDC have asked for are proposals from regions that are due on July 1st of 2015, uh, proposals that will cite some of the quality of life initiatives that, that we've talked about. Uh, so how do you get there and how do you get a 10 county region to collaborate over some of those issues? Well, they went on a field trip. The steering committee uh, that's, that's been born through this initiative in northeastern Indiana consists of a couple of elected officials, a number of business people, uh, and, and some not-for-profit people. And they hopped on a bus mm -hmm. and they toured uh, northeastern Indiana just to see the kinds of things that are out there and just to begin the networking process of collaboration. Um, the group has met a couple of times. Uh, the executive committee has met uh, more than a couple of times just to try and lay out a plan and a strategy that will allow for that decision uh, to, to be concluded by July 1st. Uh, they are taking that traveling road show to the various communities. Uh, one, to try and sell the communities on the idea of the Regional C Cities Initiative, and then two, to try and get input back from each of those communities on the types of quality of life initiatives uh, that each community thinks will enhance their uh, ability to attract jobs. Regional cities, I understand the title of it, but, but it's a little bit of a misnomer because obviously we understand that, that Fort Wayne is the linchpin here in Allen County right. as far as its importance uh, for the county as a whole. But how do you sell this to uh, communities, for example, a Grable, a Monroeville, a Harlan, a Huntertown? How, how do we get them involved as well? Well, that's a great question. The better question is, how do you get some of the further outliers like LaGrange right. County mm -hmm. and Steuben County to, to buy into the Fort Wayne way? You know, part of the work that the regional partnership has done over the last seven or eight years has been to lay that foundation for that type of collaboration. I think now people are beginning to realize that what's good for Fort Wayne is good for the region. 
and what's good for the region is, is good for Fort Wayne. And so with these focus groups, looking at things like riverfront development, looking at trails, looking at some of the things that are uh, already happening in Fort Wayne and Allen County, they sort of jump on that, that bandwagon. So I don't think the issue is going to be as much selling Monroeville and New Haven and Harlan uh, as it is uh, LaGrange County, uh, DeKalb County, and, and uh, counties to the south. Although I will say that the regional partnership has just done a tremendous job getting people to coalesce around the idea of regionalism. We've got the Mayors and Commissioners Caucus now that meets monthly where these initiatives uh, are discussed. And so we have the opportunity to listen to the LaGrange County commissioners. We have the opportunity to listen to the, uh, to the Angola mayor, uh, talk about the types of things they want to do. Um, we recognize that we are going to have to coalesce around one project in order to get this money. But I think people have come to the point that they, they want the money enough that they realize it'll have to be a project uh, in, in Fort Wayne or Allen County to really attract the attention from the state that will help this region grow. It's a draw to the rest of the region. Absolutely. Uh, as you mentioned, this is still something going through the General Assembly as we're taping this, so uh, we, we don't know exactly what the outcome will be. But even if let's say Northeast Indiana isn't chosen for some of this money. It, it, will the foundation be in place to continue this kind of dialogue and work together on, on some level, at some form, even if, if we're not exactly part of the Regional Cities Initiative? You know, in Mike, that, that's an excellent question. Um, in the discussions I've been involved in, there's been some concern that maybe the timeline is too tight um, to, to make things really, really cohesive and really, really understandable to the state by July 1st. But the caveat always is that this is a great starting place, great place to begin the dialogue, great place to perpetuate the dialogue so that if we're not chosen, we've at least developed the platform, we've developed the conversations, and we can continue to have these conversations moving forward. I am convinced in order for us to get to where I think we need to be uh, from a quality of life, quality of purpose uh, initiative, we've got to have these conversations. We're now having these conversations when five, six, seven years ago we didn't. So yes, absolutely, this is the foundation, win, lose, or draw that will help take us to the promised land. Do, do you think we have a head start over some other places in the state? I, I'm not familiar with what else is going on uh, around other right. areas of Indiana, but I do know, as we pointed out, we, we've got regional uh, objectives and initiatives that have been taking place here in Northeast Indiana for a while. From what you understand that that's going on around other areas of the state. Do we kind of have a head start in that area? Do, do we have a, a foot in the door before some of the other areas because of the work that we've been doing? Back in about 2000 or, uh, 2007 or 2008, the regional development authorities were allowed for uh, through the Indiana State Legislature. Uh, Northwest Indiana was the first one to develop one. Mm -hmm. They actually uh, found the matching money. Uh, the state kicked some money in, and they were able to do things like uh, work with the, the Gary Airport, work with some of the stuff on the northwest side of, of the state. That probably gave them a leg up just okay. in terms of how to, how to move the process forward. Now, uh, we, we are right behind them uh, because we've learned that we need to collaborate to move anything along in northeastern Indiana. Uh, we're a leg up as far as the collaboration piece goes. And so I am convinced that moving forward, it's that piece that's going to allow us to overtake any other initiative that may occur in the state of Indiana. We are now recognized uh, not only in Indianapolis, but in other parts of the Midwest as being one of the regions that has the greatest amount of collaboration and cohesiveness. And, and is this a one area, winner take all <laughs> of sorts? It, it, will one area only be chosen to receive this or is it, or can it be split or is that something that's still being 
discussed and worked out? The way the initial legislation was conceived was it was likely going to take $80 million and split it two or three different right. ways. Um, common logic at this point has dictated that with only $10 million at risk uh, through the state right now that it will likely be an award to just one community or one region. So stay tuned. We'll have to wait and see what happens in the legislature and, and depending on how much money is is uh, doled out for this particular initiative. Yep. It, could be, it could be three or four or it may just be one. That's does, exactly that make, right. does that make the task a little diff difficult for our, our officials here in, in trying to get this together? You, you talked about the, the narrow timeline that's involved, and now knowing that uh, it, it may be only one region that gets this money, d does that put more pressure? You know, it, it would if we hadn't developed the mindset that this is an exercise we really, really need to go through anyways. And so I think the, 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 the region region fathers at this particular point and mothers um, have recognized the fact that we've got to build from this foundation. So let's really forget about the, the deadline, and I say that somewhat tongue-in-cheek, sure. and let's just get on with the task of planning for the future in northeastern Indiana and see, see where it takes us. Well, we'll look forward to seeing what happens next. Thanks a lot for being with us, Commissioner Nelson. Thanks for Peters. having we me. We appreciate it and look forward to hearing more, hopefully, for our region about the Regional Cities Initiative. And that concludes another edition of County Line. Just a reminder that this program, as well as our previous County Line programs, can all be seen online at your convenience by either going to our county YouTube channel or the video on demand service that the county shares with the Allen County Public Library and the City of Fort Wayne. We have links to both of those sites at our website, www.allencounty.us. I'm Mike Green, Public Information Officer in the Allen County Commissioner's Office. Thank you for joining us, and we'll look for you next time on County Line.